Hi, uh, this is a general theory of reactivity. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Chris Kowal. You may know me from such automated information kiosks as JavaScript needs a module system or JavaScript needs asynchronous promises. So a general theory of reactivity. So in 1905, Albert Einstein put together this theoretical model that unified space and time into a, into a single theory in science, uh, and then later generalized it to include uh, gravity, making it a general theory of relativity. So the thing about being a programmer is that we trade space and time as a matter of our jobs. Uh, space for us is memory, uh, places and in, in locations in memory for our data, and time is time, but we have two kinds of time. We have synchronous time and asynchronous time. Synchronous is all of the time, uh, is uh, like a function is synchronous if it does all of its work before returning. It's asynchronous if it keeps on doing work after, after you've called it. So in Buddhism, there's a thing called a koan, which is a uh, it's a parable with a paradox, and it's supposed to teach you that logic is the beginning of wisdom and not the end. And uh, there's a functional, uh, there's a there's a koan and functional programming that's really well known, uh, where the student comes to his master and says, "I've become enlightened. I have learned everything there is to know about object-oriented programming. I now know about the virtues of encapsulation, inheritance, and composition." And I can see now that everything's an object and a teacher. It's like, okay, uh, this, is, this is all incorrect. Uh, actually, everything's a closure. Um, and so the student goes on and he learns everything they need to know about functional programming and then they come back to the master. Aha, I now know, I understand, oh, master, that everything is a closure. And the master's like, no, no, no. This is not the way of wisdom. Everything's an object. And uh, so I figure that the path to enlightenment has three steps. Uh, one, what even is? Step two, everything is. And step three, oh, okay, maybe some things are and some things aren't. And now I can tell the difference. So when I see things like this, I'm hoping that they're at step number two because it looks a whole lot like this to me. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Ar arrays are awesome. Uh, there aren't many things you can do without them. Um, and it's true that you can do everything with them because any value can fit an array. You could, put, you could put the counter inside of an array if you have to sometimes. And Python, that's actually really useful. Um, but no, in, in general, there's a, there are places where arrays are useful and where, where you wouldn't use arrays. So in this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about where to use things and when not to. Uh, I'm going to use some notation from ECMAScript 6, now known as ECMAScript 2015. I'm going to talk about things that are available today in IOJS, which is now known as Node.js, and things that you will see in evergreen browsers, which are almost all browsers, right? Uh, so I've talked about space and time. There are a lot of dimensions to reactive programming and, and reactivity and event-driven programming in general. Uh, we have synchronous versus asynchronous. We have singular and plural, like a single value or an array of values. We have lots of different cases where we'll have single consumers or multiple consumers, and we'll deal with the multiple consumer case in, in different ways, depending on whether we're unicast as in uh, we have this tight relationship with our consumer where they own us and if they are no longer interested then we should stop working and therefore we're cancelable versus broadcast where there are going to be multiple people interested in my result and that I, I'm going to want to have a completely different set of behaviors in order to prevent those consumers from interfering with each other. Um, but mostly these things are different because of the way we're going to treat the fast producer and slow consumer problem. So 
there are three kinds of ways to deal with this. There's the push style, the pull style, and a style that uses back pressure I'm just going to call pressure because it really does have a two-way relationship. In, a, in the push model, uh, for, for a concrete example of this to help make it a little bit more clear, uh, so let's, let's take a, a time series value like progress or a different time series value of like an estimated time to completion. They're basically telling you the same thing, but in a different way, and the, value, the underlying domains of those values are very different. For push, you get a discrete event. You're firing an event whenever something has changed, and this is appropriate for something like estimated time to completion, because it doesn't change continuously. It changes discreetly as you update based off of information as you receive it. So, okay, now I know that the network conditions have changed and this is gonna take longer, I'm gonna update my estimated time to completion. Whereas progress is a continuous value. It changes all the time, even when you're not observing it. Um, time itself, the, if you wanted to monitor the current time, that is a continuous value. And for those kinds of cases, you need a pull model instead of a push model and you need to use behaviors, which are the, the polling version of observers which and observables, which are the push version. And the way you deal with the, with the fast producer, slow consumer problem with these two different cases is for pushing, with something like estimated time to completion, they both, they always model the same value. And if you lose a message, it's okay, because the next one will be even more accurate and you don't have to remember the entire series that came before you. You're only interested in the most recent. Uh, in the poll case, uh, you lose information by polling slower. If the, if the, if the, slow, if the consumer slower than the producer, you just slow down and you ob observe less frequently. And when you do that, the fidelity of your measurement decreases, but the accuracy does not. And then in the cases where you actually need every value from the producer to transit all the way to the consumer, perhaps even in the correct order, that's where pressure comes in. Pressure allows your fast uh, producer to slow down in response to a slow consumer. So streams, uh, this, is where, this is what we're working up to today. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about a stream primitive and streams are very similar to arrays, and they have a lot of the same methods as arrays, but they behave slightly differently. They're like an asynchronous array. Uh, and they're going to have pressure, and they're going to always guarantee that values transit from one place to the other. They're going to have a lot of the same methods, not all, uh, but many of the same methods with a slightly different asynchronous flavor to them. So, in order to talk about this, we have to wind back to one of the most primitive concepts in programming, the value. Uh, a value has, a, it breaks down into a getter and setter, conceptually, if not in, in fact, in implementation, where uh, the getter and setter are duels of each other. And, it's a, it, the, and it, it's, this is the primitive that lies at the intersection, of, at the origin of this entire space. It's, it's synchronous and singular. And I, I'm introducing this slide to you, most, not so much because this is enlightening, but because it's the pattern that, we, that establishes all of the other primitives in this reactive programming space, uh, if done properly, where they're broken down into a producer side and a consumer side. Information flows in one direction. Uh, and they're duals. And what, a dual, what duality means is that if you're talking about dual functions, the, you just replace the arguments on one side with the return value on the other, and, well, one argument on one side and one return value on the other. You swap them, and, they're, and if they're the same, they're duals. So in this case, set is accepting a value, get is returning a value, and get is re ex uh, accepting nothing, and set is returning nothing. This becomes more interesting later when these, this void case becomes something else. Um, so talking about singular, it's most easy to go off to the familiar territory of plurality. And for plurals, we have collections. And there are a lot of kinds of collections. Um, but they all break down into, uh, ultimately, they can be broken down into an iterator and a generator, usually, where the iterator is the consumer side and the generator is the producer side. You don't always have these, and just as you don't always have a getter and a setter for a value, but uh, this is how it breaks down in terms of duals. 
So let's take a look at an iterator. Uh, an iterator just gives you the consumer side of some conceptual collection. And it, in JavaScript, in ECMAScript uh, 2015, uh, this, it just has this one method called next. If you're familiar with Python, it's very similar. But one thing that's different is that instead of throwing an exception, uh, or pardon, throwing a stopped iteration exception, we're going to return these iteration objects that capture uh, whether the iteration has completed when the done property and what the value is for the current iteration. And if it comes to the end of the sequence, you're going to get a done as true and optionally even a value in that case. A generator is the dual. So instead of, uh, instead of having a next method that returns a thing that can model all of the cases of a thrown exception or a value of an iteration or the value of the conclusion, what we have is a separate method for each of these cases. So we either pump in a value or we pump in a value to return or we pump in an exception to be thrown. So one way to compose these things is to make these two duals of a generator and observer. And this is a synchronous pushing type abstraction. Uh, when you call the next method, it's going to in turn call the observe method, uh, the on next method that, it was, that its consumer has provided for you, and call that on the stack, um, and then return when it's done. So this is a synchronous pushing of data. Every time, for example, the estimated time to completion has changed, I call next with that new value, and my consumer receives that value. And it, of course, can be, uh, that, that sequence can be terminated by calling on return, and, uh, and it can be terminated abnormally by calling on throw. Uh, it, and interestingly, interestingly about observers is just like arrays, you can concatenate them because of that conclusion property. So let's talk about uh, my example of uh, estimated time to completion and progress. Uh, so for the pushing case, we're going to use an observer. For the pulling case, we're going to use an iterator. Uh, progress is going to be uh, this continuous value that's changing over time. So you're going to want to sample that at a, at a rate that is reasonable to you. For example, if you're writing a web page, you would use your animation frame rate as your, as your pulling frequency for this thing that's changing all the time. And on the other hand, if you're writing something that is uh, pushing the estimated time to completion, you're going to, create, uh, you're going to create an iterator out of that so that you can update, your, update the underlying uh, start time and end time and then compute your progress at any given time from that. Uh, so observers are something that if, you, if you're interested in observers, definitely look into the work of Eric Meyer and Rx. Uh, FRP is where this notion of uh, behaviors or continuous variables uh, comes from. So definitely look into the work of Conal Elliott and the FRP world. So there's another way to combine this in the poll case, where you can combine an iterator and a generator, except this time it's going, instead of pushing, like the observer case, we're going to pull with the iterator. And this is going to be backed by a function. It's going to be synchronous. Uh, the iterator is going to cause the function to resume from wherever it left off each time you call it. Um, and instead of having a generator object that has uh, this yield method, or next method as it were, or a return method or throw method, these are going to become keywords in the context of this generator function. And we're just going to walk through that function to produce values whenever we're asked for one. Um, in order to explain this, I'm going to talk about is a, a synchronous analog in space. Uh, this is a function that returns an array of the values in a range from a start to stop with some stride or step between each of, the, uh, each of the values in that interval. And it's going to build it all up in space and return it as an array. Um, it's relatively succinct to write it this way. Uh, and it has the advantage of, of building it all up, but the disadvantage that it can't model anything of indefinite size, um, and it definitely takes memory. You can trade memory for time um, by making it lazy using a generator function. I'm introducing some new syntax from ECMAScript 2015. Uh, you'll notice function star. Function star is a modified form of function. Instead of returning immediately, it's not going to do anything at all when you call it except return an iterator. Uh, 
and that iterator is going to govern how it continues uh, and whether it continues at all. Uh, and you'll notice that it's actually even more succinct than the example with an array. We're going to start at the start value, we're going to continue until the stop value, and each of those values we're going to uh, yield and then continue for each time we call it. Uh, so we call this the range function, we get an iterator, we call the next method, and each time it resumes from where it left off, initially at the beginning. You can imagine there's an imagine, imaginary procedure pointer uh, at the beginning of the function, and then it's just it, when you call the, the range function, it starts there, and then when you call next the first time, it proceeds through this the first check on this while loop, and then it hits yield, and it returns the value, in this case, zero. Uh, you get an iteration object that says that this isn't, the, this isn't the conclusion of the iteration and the value zero. And then you call next again, and it resumes from there, incrementing, going back to the condition, and then getting to the yield, and then stopping there to return your value. So, and also another thing to note about that is that uh, you'll notice that the iterator and generator objects themselves are duals of each other. So uh, one of the interesting things about generator functions is that you can pass a value in, and that becomes the evaluation of the, of the yield expression. And this gives you a lot of power, because that return value and yield allows you to build more interesting things on top of it. So now that we've covered space, let's talk a little bit about getting into time. In time, we, uh, we start to model the asynchronous version of a singular value as a deferred. And a deferred breaks up into a producer and consumer side, just like a value does. Um, not every implementation makes this distinction, but it's good to make this separation so that you can have information flow in one direction and you can pass these objects to different, uh, different entities and guarantee that they can only communicate um, through the capability that you've given them. Uh, in the case of a deferred, it breaks down into a promise side, which is the consumer, and the resolver side, which is the producer. A deferred can produce exactly on only one value, and it provides the guarantee that it'll only provide that value, and the promise uh, can have multiple observers. So this is a multicast, uh, uh, that is a broadcast uh, primitive. So going back to our familiar diagram of how a value breaks down or how a collection breaks down into its duals, a deferred, here we have it, broken down into its promise and resolver. The promise side has a then method that allows you to uh, register your observers, which is going to be an on-return function and an on-throw function. The producer side is going to have the corresponding methods to return a value into the, uh, to the consumer or to throw an exception to the consumer. Another interesting thing about promises is that is if you return a promise into another promise, that promise assumes the responsibility for that resolution. So you can create chains of promises or return promises inside of handler functions in order to defer work when you know you need to do more work. Like for example, if you get somebody's username and then you know, okay, I've got the username, but I can't resolve this promise that, I, that I've returned yet because I need to go off and fetch some data from a database in order to complete that. So instead of returning the, uh, the ultimate resolution, you return more work to be done to obtain that resolution. A good promise implementation has a something like the then method, which is the compositional problem for uh, compositional piece for building promises uh, uh, from other promises in serial. The input promise, in this case in, is going to have an ultimate value. You have you've registered an observer for its value or the or the error, and you uh, again using some more ECMAScript 2015 notation, we're passing in a function. Uh, in this case, it's using arrow functions, which are new syntax. When you receive, when, when, when the, the promise receives a value, it's going to inform you by calling this, uh, this function and giving you that value. And then the interesting thing about making this composable is that these outres functions, uh, these outres expressions, become responsible for resolving the out promise returned by then. So with this primitive, you're able to make sequences of these things and because it's a promise, you're guaranteed that it's only going to call one case or the other, and not both, or not one more than once, and you're only going to get one resolution at the end of the day. And a resolution is either an exception or a value. 
by contrast, if you were to simply use a callback with, say, this function YOLO, you only live once. You're going to call this thing. You have no idea what is going to happen. What are the things that can happen when you call this function? Well, it can invalidate your state assumptions. It can call that function multiple times. It can call it just once. It might never call it. It might not call before it returns. And so you really know nothing about what it's going to do. You've given it the right to do anything it wants. And in production, it probably will do what you didn't want, either because of a programmer error or malice or whatever. Um, in the case of console log, we've got I and who knows what it is. Promises make it possible to manage asynchroneity by giving you guarantees about order independence. It does not matter the order in which you add an observer to a promise. It does not matter the order in, uh, whether you resolve it before or after. Uh, the behavior is going to be the same regardless, which means that the things that you test in development are going to be the same things that happen in production. And you can use this to synchronize asynchronous events. So I've shown you promises. Promises have been around for a little while. I've got a library queue that's been out in, uh, out in NPM for about four years now. Promises are in browsers now. I'm assuming you actually know all of this. But the new thing that's going to happen in probably the next version of, of JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript, ECMAScript uh, 2016 possibly, is asynchronous functions. An async function is just like, just as we extended a normal function to make a generator function to produce arrays, we're going to have async functions to produce promises for eventual values, and with the assistance of uh, additional syntax to make it more clear. Um, under the hood, it's just going to be calling then a lot, but uh, what it looks like is a synchronous function with await keywords interpolated throughout it. And what happens is very similar to what happens with a generator and is, in fact, emulatable using generators and a decorator uh, to turn it into an async function. The async keyword modifies this function so that it will return a promise unconditionally. It will return a promise. Uh, and it also will not start working until a future event. So you're guaranteed that it can't interfere with state in your closure until you've yielded to the event loop. Um, it has an await keyword which can receive a promise, and it will pause the execution of that function at that point until that promise has a resolution. When it is resolved, it will either it will resume at the point of the await keyword with either throwing an exception or the value of the promise. Um, so this, uh, and await binds a little more tightly than, than yield to make it a little easier to, uh, to make fewer parentheses necessary for this kind of composition than you would with just yield. So in this case, I have a time function. It takes a job callback, which is going to do some job and return a promise for the completion of that job. I'm going to keep track of when it started. I'm going to start that job. And when it's concluded, I'm going to uh, resolve the promise returned by time with the amount of time that that job took. And so I take this async function called sum. It receives two functions that can return promises. Uh, I await upon their results combine the values, and it returns the sum. So sum returns a function. I observe that uh, the promise for, that, uh, for the time, and then log it to the console. So promises, in summary, give you order independence. Uh, they guarantee asynchroneity, which is sometimes in the JavaScript world called containing Zalgo, this demon that will emerge and make your production systems break when you least expect it, uh, by doing things in orders that you did not test for. Uh, it is a defensive primitive. You can give the, 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 each of these pieces to a different entity, and you can know that they can't interfere with each other. It gives you POLA, the principle of least authority. You're giving different people exactly what they need to do their job and nothing more. Uh, they're chainable for serial. They're composable, so you can do parallel. They're a gateway for using promises as proxies for remote objects, because once you're liberated from being in the same space, in the same time, you can be in a different process entirely and send messages to each other asynchronously. So you can have a promise that is essentially your gate to speaking to an object in another process. Um, and promises came to me by way of Mark Miller, and who has given quite a bit of inspiration and uh, coaching for the development of promises in JavaScript as a whole, and uh, has a 
Miller columns, the column view in OS X is named after him because of his work on those uh, at Xerox PARC. Uh, so, to our riveting conclusion, streams, where we triangulate from what we did to make, uh, to make singular into plural with collections, with iterators, and what we did to a value to make it asynchronous. Uh, between these two things, we get a stream which has a reader side and a writer side, the producer and the consumer. Um, and it's important to separate these things. Things get ugly when you have an object that is serving both roles. But in order to build a stream, I'm going to have to tell you about some more stuff. Uh, we're going to build streams using promise queues. A promise queue is one of, these more, one of these asynchronous primitives that is able to transport a value in time. And it gives you order independence, just like a promise does. It's a, so what you're going to do is you're going to have a consumer side that has a get method. It's going to return a promise for a value. It's going to have a put method where you can put a value or a promise for a value onto the queue. The important thing about promise queues is that they are order independent. You do not have to put before you get. You can put as many things as you want onto, onto a promise queue. You can get as many things as you want off. You can inter interpolate this. It does not matter. The things are going to come out in the same order that they were put in, or at least when they're resolved. Um, so each corresponding get is going to get the uh, each get is going to get the corresponding value that was put, regardless of what time it's put on. So, it occurs to me that once we have this promise queue thing, we can use this promise queue to transport iterator iterations. And uh, since we have this iteration concept now, with the, which the next method's going to return these iteration objects, we can create a promise queue of iterations. So we're going to call get and we're going to get an iteration object. It is going to say whether the sequence on the other side of the queue is, uh, has completed or not and what value it has sent us. Um, and, and likewise, so we're going to put iterations on one side and get iterations on the other. The implementation of an asynchronous promise queue is really succinct, though impenetrable. Uh, it's an asynchronous linked list. This is the entire implementation, or at least one valid interpretation. Um, Essentially, you keep a linked list where there's a, a, a deferred which has both sides, uh, the, the consumer side and the, and the producer side, and you're going to walk the linked list separately on the, uh, with get and put. So now we have this promise queue, and we're going to use it to transport iterations. What we can do to get, uh, get back pressure is to have two of these things. We'll have one promise queue that we're going to use to transport iterations from the producer to the consumer and another promise queue to send acknowledgement iterations back from the consumer to the producer. This allows us to write systems where uh, the writer puts values into the, into the stream and the, the reader receives those values and when it receives those values it's giving the message back to the producer that it has room for more. And this allows them to synchronize with each other, which is a clue that this is one of those things where there's this very close relationship, this cancelable relationship between the producer and consumer. So the, the consumer side is going to be able to uh, provide premature ter termination by calling throw on the consumer side just as well as the producer can provide premature ter termination by sending uh, a throw on the producer side. And also, you can use this to create buffers. And it's essentially the same thing where you have a, a reader and a writer, and they're behind the scenes there this, there's this dual, pro uh, dual gen uh, promise queues, uh, providing and, and uh, transporting iterations back and forth. Uh, but what you do is you seed the, the acknowledgement queue with the number of things that you want to have in parallel from the producer, saying, OK, I'm going I'm to put. 10 iterations onto the producer onto the consumer side and it's going to notify the producer please do 10 things before I call next again and this keeps them in sync with 10 things in flight at any given time so you may recall async functions you may recall uh, generator functions put the thing the put the two things together you get async generator functions and this is why generators aren't sufficient on their own. We can compose them to make a primitive in the language that produces streams. 
Uh, we're going to use both the async and the star. We're going to use both the yield and the await. This thing is going to pause on, uh, on promises and resume when those promises are resolved. And, it's and when it hits yield, it's going to provide the value uh, to the asynchronous iterator that it has returned. So that is a general theory of reactivity. Those are the four primitives you've got. I have some uncanny visualizations that were implemented with a prototype of uh, what this should look like in the language. Um, so this is a piece of example code where we have a source stream. It's going to take an iterator. The iterator is going to have a range of values from 0 to 100, and we're going to produce a stream from this iterator, noting that the stream isn't going to immediately consume that iterator. It's going to consume pieces from that iterator as they're demanded by a consumer. We're going to call the map method, which is going to take one of those values. It's going to cause a delay of 250 milliseconds and then return that value. And then what we're going to do is take this source iteration and then break it up in parallel. We're going to map through it uh, with three different consumers. And what happens when you do this is you'll note that the progress of the, of the source stream proceeds much more quickly because it's, being distri it's distributing the tasks evenly among the consumers based on the rate at which they are able to consume. Whereas if you do a fork in a stream where you want every consumer to see every value from, uh, from the single source, then you're going to have to synchronize that. So what we do for that is we have uh, a fork. We're going to uh, fork is going to return an array of three streams, and then we're going to, for each of those, consume them at a different rate. And you'll notice that it moves much more slowly. It moves at the pace of the slowest producer. I'm not going to let this run its course. Um, so when you introduce asynchroneity, then you can add this. Uh, you can have all of the methods of an array, or most of the methods of an array, um, and then you can introduce a third argument to all of the existing array methods, which is your concurrency limit, the number of things that it will, number of jobs that it will do at any given time with values from that source. So if I give it 32, it's going to take 32 values off of the source iteration and do 32 tasks in parallel at any given time. And as one task completes, it'll take another value and start another. And this is an example of how this causes a bottleneck where we have a, a, high, uh, a highly concurrent map process up front and a very unconcurrent process down at the bottom that's just taking one value in serial. Um, and so what you see here is that at first the map32 uh, starts takes a whole bunch of values off of the source, but then it quickly becomes uh, bottlenecked by the, the ultimate consumer. The interesting thing about a map is when you introduce parallelism, you no longer get order guarantees. When you do things in serial, you can guarantee that orders are value, uh, order, that values transit from producer to consumer in the same order. When you introduce asynchroneity, they spread out, and then if they take different amounts of time to finish their job, they flow through the system in a different order. Um, and you can use the uh, reduce function, just like an array, where we take a currently aggregated value and a new value plucked from the source or from the pool of values already uh, accumulated. Uh, and then do some work on it. In this case, I'm trying to find the maximum from, uh, from an, uh, a, a source with, of random values from 0 to 199. Uh, and I want to know the, the last one. The reduce function, instead of returning a stream, it returns a promise for that last aggregate value. And this one I'll just let run, I think. Uh, no, I'll, so basically what's happening here is that the reduce function is plucking two values at a time from the candidate pool and uh, running a job asynchronously to find uh, which, uh, which one of those two values is the maximum of the two. And then when it completes that job, it resolves the promise. And then the one that was smaller gets, re uh, gets rejected into the not in x pool. And the larger one gets returned to the candidate pool. And then uh, a certain number of these, these checks are allowed to occur in, pr in parallel by that last argument you provide to reduce. And then at the end, it's going to provide the maximum value. Let's watch. So far, we have 99, 199, that's high, a contender. The 97 is still a contender because it hasn't been compared against anything greater than it since it was last put in the candidate pool. Um, and things are coming to a close. No longer anything in the source. Compare the th things that remain, and 99 wins. And then you can do the same thing with 
chains of maps and reduces where you have chains of producers and consumers all linked up. In this case, I'm doing a map to provide a, a, a set of values for a reducer. And then uh, it does the same exact thing except with a, a map step in between. The visualization isn't compellingly different. Um, that is a general theory of reactivity. I wrote an article on this. You can find it easily by searching for GTOR, general theory of reactivity. Uh, I work at Uber, we're hiring. Uh, we have a team that's working on a, a network overlay system that uh, allows RPC, and, uh, RPC communication uh, between uh, n any number of services that introduce themselves and, and there's no configuration necessary to know where each of the nodes are. If you're interested in that, come and talk to me about that too. And otherwise, thank you for coming. <laughs>